have to be loud and enthusiastic or I will go to sleep. As my colleague Ein said, I just traveled 30 hours straight from Boston and arrived about 5.30 this morning in beautiful Napida. So I am counting on you to keep me awake. We want the entire week to be interactive. So as we go along, if anything is unclear or you object to anything, just um, speak up. The first two sessions this morning are really the general context of fiscal decentralization in emerging economies. The first session will talk in more detail exactly what we mean by fiscal decentralization and how the interaction of politics and economics makes it so very difficult to do successfully. The economics are relatively straightforward, relatively simple. But if you forget the politics, you are doomed to fail. And then our second session, we will focus especially on the context of emerging economies. What are the special challenges, but also the special opportunities for lower income countries that want to decentralize? And at the end of the second session, we'll look around the world globally, what has been the experience of okay. efforts to decentralize. And we'll apply a lot of these concepts in the afternoon. I believe the third session will be looking at decentralization in China and Vietnam. And the last session will be one of many cases from Myanmar itself. So um, we talked a little bit about decentralization last year in our introductory first uh, program. So we tried to link this year to last year. So you'll see a little bit of overlap and then we drill down in much greater detail. One year is a long time and maybe you need just a little bit of refreshing. One other logistical note, even though we are starting late, we will end on time so that you will have the coffee break on time. So I will just have to be a little bit more efficient. So you see in the middle, there is a picture. Can somebody tell me what the picture has to do with fiscal decentralization? Tell me an after breakfast story. We cannot go to the next slide till you tell me a story, so sorry is to Oops. implement. This is the decentralization. This is the implement, uh -huh. the, the implement the budget. Okay. Yeah. And then the, the middle one, the circle one, is circle. I see the one circle. Yeah. No, no, I mean. This one. Like oh, in okay. the middle. Oh, the, here? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. maybe it's a circle. Okay. Okay, the, the big hand, one person is from the uh, central. So big hand, this is also... Yes, uh, only handed, but who will implement it, decentralization? They will share. Okay, so this, this is three. a U.S. dollar. Yeah. It's money. Yeah. Okay? okay, so the big hand holds the... and also carrying the load. Yeah. Good story? Okay. Good story? Yes? 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 Can we go on? Okay, okay. I think you're still a little sleepy. So people say fiscal decentralization. Many people use the same words to mean different things. So we're going to look at a little more detail what we mean by decentralization and then fiscal. So decentralization is giving up control to a lower level of government of certain functions. And every country in the world, including Myanmar, is decentralized in some way. And the key is to figure out where you are in decentralization and what is the most promising next steps for more decentralization. So I'm going to list the stages of decentralization, starting with the most centralized to the most decentralized. So I'm going to describe each type, and then you are going to give me examples. So the first step in decentralization, where many countries start, is something we call deconcentration. So the workers still work for the central government. I'm sorry? The workers still are central government employees. They are paid by the central government. Their careers, their promotions are decided by central ministries. But they are physically often moved out of the capital to provincial or local offices. So you're trying to move government services closer to the people that you're trying to serve. The officials are given some authority to make smaller decisions affecting smaller amounts of money. 
So the officials that you move out of the capital have some authority to make smaller decisions. And the idea is that they can be more responsive to the people by making decisions more quickly and maybe better decisions. Can you think of a government ministry, central ministry, that has provincial or state or local offices? So a central government ministry that has offices maybe below the central level regional or local health offices, um, especially for preventive health or maybe maternal and child care, kind of simple health delivery, you can move closer to the people where time is very important. So you have already an example of, de of deconcentration, the first step in decentralization in Myanmar. Another example, a different sector, a different ministry, that's very common around the world, especially for maybe primary and secondary education. Maybe higher education is too big, but again, like primary health, maybe primary education. So the teachers might be central government civil servants, but a lot of decision making is local. Is this another example from Myanmar? So you get the idea, other common uh, ministries, agriculture. No. What is the main occupation for most people in Myanmar? Farming? Agriculture? Yes, I do this would be another example. I was surprised. Often the central government tax authority has regional tax offices. Not local taxes, central taxes. Is this true in Myanmar? Are they nice offices? No. In many countries, they're very nice offices. So you get the idea of deconcentration. Already many examples from Myanmar. Another example, it's still central government, and you're taking an activity that is part of a ministry and moving it off budget to be separate. For example, a state enterprise. If it's in the budget, all you see are inputs, people, materials, equipment but you don't know if this is profitable or an efficient business. You make it like a separate business with its own financial statements, balance sheet, um, income and loss, and so on. So the only thing on the budget, if it is losing money, you have a subsidy to the enterprise. And if it is making money, hopefully they pay taxes and dividends to the government. Does Myanmar have any state enterprises? Over here. For example, give me a state enterprise from Myanmar. It would be a commercial bank with a development function. So it's very common to have a government-owned bank or many banks. Absolutely. Um, another example. Electrics. Electric. Electric. Yeah. It could be um, electricity or power authority. It could be um, other utilities. It could be telecommunications. It could be water. It could be... Um, Airline, maybe. So, um, and often, oh, please. I'm sorry. These are very good examples. And often, this is the first step in privatization, or as my dear friends in Vietnam say, equitization, which is more precise because it means changing ownership. So, it's good for politics, but it's also technically accurate. The third type is what most people think about when they think about decentralization. When you transfer authority from one level of government to another, we call it devolution. In this case, I'm not sure if we have an example yet from Myanmar, so I will give you an example from other countries. For example, primary education and secondary education in the United States is local government's responsibility. So American They are responsible for financing the education, for hiring the teachers, paying the teachers, building the schools, designing the curriculum, everything is local. Many countries collecting trash, solid waste is local. Water and wastewater services are often local. Public transportation, subway, buses in many countries are local. Local means financing, operating, and supervising. In many emerging economies, Local irrigation systems and local roads, farm to market roads, are local. And much of this 
around the world is paid for by a local tax, land and building tax, or local user fees or user charges. So later this week, we will have an entire session on each of these. Sorry. Now, so uh, uh, DICA, it, uh, it, like uh, called uh, MIC uh, in the region, regional government uh, can allow the so many foreign investment under five million U.S. dollar. That's why. So, the, can we call that it is a devolution? Yes. Yeah, so maybe um, they can make decisions for smaller FDI or yes, yes FDI. Yes. What sectors usually? A every sector. It, no need uh, now. Is so under five U.S. Uh, under a U.S. five a U.S. dollar five million. Okay. Regional government can allow. Give me, give me an example. Yeah, for example, uh, for uh, industry, some food uh, okay. processing industry, other industry. Okay. Yes, yeah, so that's another way of mobilizing resources yes. by smaller foreign investment. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the now is so that no need, uh, the, uh, no need uh, to get the approval by the central. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So on the revenue side, I mentioned local taxes, local charges. Your example is equity. Other people's money, that's the best equity. And in many countries, local government can also borrow. We'll talk about that later. You want to be very, very, very careful about this. It's more common in higher income countries. In Europe and Japan, usually loans. In the United States, usually from the capital markets by issuing municipal bonds. And the last type of decentralization is taking it out of the public sector completely. So if it's not public sector, where does it go? Yes, it's, it's not a trick question. Public can be private. It doesn't have to be partnership. It could be privatized. Private for profit or private not for profit? Public, private. What's the third choice? Don't ever forget the third choice. What's the third choice? Combining the first two, I want something different, completely different. Not public, not private. What, what is the full name of Myanmar? The full proper name of the country. Somebody tell me, the full proper name. So who are we forgetting here? Is so that just uh, uh, federal or the democracy? Democratization? It doesn't, no. it doesn't have to be democracy, but you're getting close. What if I don't say democracy? but I say participatory government. Who's participating? Uh, central government. Yeah. Uh, central go central uh, government, like people. No, no. Someone says people. The people, thank you. Who said the people? Don't forget the people. Communities, yeah? They're not public, they're not private, they're the people. Let me give you two examples. So in many countries, before the rainy season, the community gets together to clean out the drainage canal so there's no flooding. No government, no government money, no government equipment, all from the people. This is mainly in rural areas or small towns. And an example from cities. Often communities will organize what we call a neighborhood watch to look for problems or crime in the neighborhood. They're not the police. If something is serious, then they will call for um, police or other assistance. So I think you have a very good idea that you have different stages of decentralization. And you can see in Myanmar, by sector and by function, where you are today. For example, functions, it can be planning, financing, implementation, monitoring, or evaluation. And for one sector, it's often mixed together. For example, primary education. Maybe you want community participation, so bottom-up planning um, is community. community. <laughs> Maybe the financing comes from the central government. Maybe building schools or producing textbook is private sector, contracting. 
And usually monitoring and evaluation is from the people paying for it, so maybe central government again. If you are not confused, I will make you more confused now. Because when you decentralize, you often talk about unequal decentralization, not everywhere at the same time. Maybe you start in the cities or the local governments with more capacity, or maybe one part of the country is weaker, that will be later. And I said education, but higher education can be different from primary education. Somebody gave an example of health, but hospitals can be very different from primary health clinics. We spent a lot of time talking about the concept of decentralization because for the entire week we will come back to these concepts with our case studies. But fiscal is very easy to describe. What does fiscal mean to you? Fiscal. It's an easy question, not a uh, trick question. Uh, it includes in the tax, uh, tax and other fees and charges. Uh, this is a revenue. Expenditure is side, uh, includes in the current capital uh, financial. Financial means uh, debt. This is foreign loan, domestic loan. Uh, this is a uh, physical. I will say it in two words. Public money. Raising money and spending money as you described. Why am I interested in fiscal decentralization, not political or administrative decentralization? Most politicians, when they make speeches, they say, yes, decentralization, power to the people, yes, yes, yes. Local government said, prove it, where is the money? An easy way to measure decentralization in your country over time or between your country and other countries is to look at the money. So if you want to know how decentralized you are, just one question, one question only. Who generates resources and who allocates resources? Where does the money come from and who spends the money? In America, we say, Whoever pays the piper, that is, whoever pays the musician, decides the song. Whoever has the resources has the control. The other major question I wanted to address this session is, if we understand what is decentralization, we should understand why a country will want to decentralize. As you might guess from the title, the political economy of decentralization, I will give you economic reasons and political reasons. And the economics is probably a bit easier to understand. You're trying to improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of the government. In business, we have a concept called span of control or area of control. And in a country, for example, as big and diverse as Myanmar, you cannot do everything from the capital. Conditions around the country are different, priorities are different, needs are different, and it's hard to know all of that sitting in the capital. Remember the first step, deconcentration, is dealing with the problem, how do you get the right services to the right people in the right amounts? And if many different local governments try to deal with the same challenges, you have innovation, experimentation, and you can learn from each other. And local governments will share. They will visit each other. They will learn from each other. Failures as well as successes. We say more heads working on a problem is better than fewer. Another problem is the central government cannot pay for everything. So the first two reasons we're really on providing better services, the spending side. Number three is on the funding side. So this is why we will talk later about potential local government taxes and charges. And the last economic reason is just some changes in the overall environment. In Myanmar, what is probably the most significant demographic change over time. Demographic change, movement of people. Transfer to urban. To? Urbanization. Urbanization, moving to the cities, yes. absolutely. 
Absolutely. And urbanization is a big challenge. Provide jobs and housing and services. It's a big challenge, but it's a big opportunity. If you try to provide pipe water in a rural area, the distances between houses is big and the density is low. So the price per household is very high. But in the city, if you have a water and a sewage pipe, one kilometer can serve thousands of families. So unit costs or cost per household go down dramatically. You also have a lot of people moving to the cities who are very ambitious. You have a great potential pool of people who can work for the city that you don't have in rural areas. So these are some of the economic reasons that seem quite logical, but we also have some political reasons. We said you can't pay for everything, but also you don't want to be responsible for everything. So if you complain, government services are very bad, the minister will say, oh, I feel so bad, I'm sorry. But talk to the governor, talk to the mayor, not my problem. A more positive reason is trying to improve transparency, accountability, to improve government and governance. As, government, as countries develop, people demand a larger voice in making decisions. Maybe by election or demonstrations or violent demonstrations or by leaving and not leaving just the city but leaving the country. So to remain in power you have to start listening a little bit more carefully. And as incomes go up, people demand better services and have the capacity to pay for better services. The last reason is probably the most sensitive political reason. Many countries have areas that would like to break away and become independent. Later in the week, we will look at an example from Indonesia and another one from the Philippines. So sometimes for the nation to stay together, the government has to give up some power. So one area of the country might have some special extra autonomy to keep them in the country. And we'll give you examples later in the week. This chart is in your recommended reading, so I'm just putting it up here so you can check it if you want. It talks about trends in governance from the 20th century to the 21st century. It's the reading by Anwar Shah from the World Bank, which gives you an overview of decentralization around the world. A key question we will come back to that's very important for Myanmar is a bit of a dilemma we have when we decentralize. And I will go into this in great detail with the Indonesia case study. The same reading by Mr. Anwar Shah about decentralization. And we're looking at the last column, developing countries. And sub-national expenditures below the central government, we can see are anywhere from maybe one quarter to almost half of all public expenditures. And in some sectors, like we talked about education and health, it can be anywhere from half to almost everything. But the revenue as a percent of GDP, for example, averages about 5% of GDP, but expenditures on average are over 7, so about 2% of GDP difference. There's a gap. Well, the central government tells local government, you must do this, 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 and this but we're not giving you any new taxes, no new money. So you have what we call a fiscal gap, a difference between what you're supposed to do and the money you have to pay for it. So often you also have, as part of decentralization, a government transfer program from the central government to subnational. So as a percentage of the local budget, the transfers can be anywhere from about half to maybe four-fifths, from 40% to maybe 80%. The transfers as a share of the local budget. So I believe we will have a separate session just on transfers. And we will keep talking about this the entire week. Except 
for maybe Yangon and maybe one or two other places. In Myanmar, most of the local budget is from the central government. I think the main thing about this slide is that sometimes you will keep revenue collection centralized but decentralized spending decisions. Sometimes it's just more efficient if many local governments don't have the capacity to collect complicated taxes. But this is also the model in some high income countries like France. Or like in China, you might have tax sharing where local government will help the central government to collect central taxes, but they get to keep some of it. So during this week, we are going to discuss many different options. We're not going to say there is one magic system that's good for every country. But we want you to understand the different choices and the advantages and disadvantages of the different choices. And what you choose today might not be appropriate in 10 years. You might change again. So I said I would end on time, and I believe we're around coffee break time. <laughs> so we're going to end with one last slide with a picture, very similar to the first picture. So after our discussion, somebody has to explain to me what this picture has to do with fiscal decentralization before you can have your coffee break. And I want to hear a new voice. Anybody who has not spoken, tell me a story about this and decentralization. So the budget that is, that the budget that is decentralized should be allocated equally to different gender, male and female. That's her opinion on this. Oh, gender. <laughs> Any other stories to go with the gender, e gender Sama parity, gender equality? But at, but at the local level, but at the, at the bottom level, it's kind of like uh, they are uh, fighting each other to get what amount uh, each, get, each can get. So you have competition for resources <laughs> between local governments. Absolutely, and it goes back to the investment decisions. The U.S. is a federal system, like Germany or Australia, and so there's lots of competition between governments for domestic and foreign resources. So we got not one, but two very good stories. And economists like to say there is no such thing as free food or free drinks. So you worked very hard for your coffee break. Enjoy, and I will see you at 11 o'clock.